All right, so today I'm gonna to do something a little bit different. I'm gonna show you all of my snakes in the entire reptile room. And let me tell you, the number is always changing because I'm hatching stuff out, I'm selling stuff at the shows, and I actually need to step back and count how many snakes I had. I actually have 58 snakes in this reptile room right now and that number is going to change tomorrow because i'm going to reptile show tomorrow and the next day denver repticon june 15th and 16th 2019 at the rapaho county fairgrounds and probably by the time you see this video it'll be the end of the second day because i'm always posting videos a day in advance so i put it together the one day and then edit it and upload it and then the next day <laughs> I put it up. So this snake, I can show you this snake. This is my first snake. This is pretty much the mascot for my channel. This is, I, I named him Bobby. This is my bamboo ball python. And he is the father to every single bamboo that I've ever produced. So when we're going through my collections and I say, hey, this is a bamboo mixed with something else. This is the father. This is where it all came from. All right, so first I'll give you a quick tour of the room. These are all my grow out racks. I have some females, one that laid eggs. I have some males in here. A couple boa tubs on the bottom. I have my corn snake in one of those tubs. This is one of my hatchling racks. I think I just have seven hatchlings right now. And I have some uh, breeder ball python females up here. My reticulated python is in that big tub. His name is Sunny. And then on the bottom, I have some more ball pythons over here. I have my rat breeder breeding racks over here, more rats over here, and then some mice up on the top, and then tucked back in the corner over here, I actually have kind of an overflow, it's an ARIS 1065, that holds 65 hatchlings. If I get to the point where I have so many hatchlings, essentially what I'll do is I'll move these frogs out and slide that over and I'll start filling that up with ball python hatchlings. All right, so I'm gonna start with my smallest ball python and that is a bamboo. This guy just hatched out just a few weeks ago. He's already shed and had a couple meals. He's doing great. And these little, they, they have really high contrast when they're young and they obviously Obviously they hold their contrast when they get older. They also have incredible feeding responses. Really easy to keep and breed bamboos. All right, here's another hatchling. Came from a different pairing. This one is actually a normal 100% het pied. He's a squirrely little guy. And these guys are doing really great. This actually came from my fire pied, uh, so it doesn't have any fire in it. It just has 100% het pied because the dad was a visual pied. Here's another bamboo hatchling. This one is a little bit bigger than the last one. They ate a couple meals, shed out already, doing really good. And these guys are actually 50% het caramel albino so there's a 50 percent chance that they could carry one copy of the caramel albino gene all right so this one is a fire 100 percent head pied as a matter of fact these are the first fires i produced looks almost like a, a normal but it has a, an enhancer gene called the fire you breed two fires together you get a super fire which is an all white snake this one's also 100 percent het pied so here's another fireball python this one actually shed out the other one's still kind of in a shed and you can see once they shed out they get really bright and intense these fires are really awesome snakes you can see there's kind of a little lighter head stamp right on top of the head and definitely kind of affects the patterns you get less alien heads and really bright colors on these fires and these guys are a hundred percent head pied you can't really see tracks like you can on a normal down the belly and this guy already ate so he's doing really good he's got a lot of spunk to him beautiful snake all right, so in this tub, we have a normal 100% head pied. Let me tell you, these are always in high demand at the shows. You want to get into a pied project for hardly any money, you can pick up a normal 100% het pied. Really good investment for breeding uh, in the into the pied projects. So in this tub, we have a fire 100% head pied. You can see this one is in shed, and when they're in shed, they don't really have the intensity, but once they shed out, they really pop. It's really crazy. All right, so now we're moving up to some hatchlings from last year that are about a year old. And the good thing about going through these tubs is I can actually spot clean. What I do for spot cleaning is, uh, so these cups aren't really that old, so they're not that dirty. I just basically dump out the water and refill them. 
And then what I do is just kind of go through with this little cute little water can and just kind of hydrate a little bit. You definitely want some humidity in here so it stays nice and humid. Ball pythons really like uh, probably about 50 to 60 percent humidity. And this guy is actually a female lemon blast bamboo. Really awesome snake. This one's definitely going to be at the show. I know a lot of people are eyeing this. As a matter of fact, I kind of had this crawling around the display when a lot of people walk by and people are just kind of stunned how beautiful that snake is so amazing all right so this one is a female scaleless head 50 percent head caramel albino and the scaleless head gene is kind of interesting it has just a few scales missing from the head of the snake if you breed two of them together you get a completely scaleless ball python which is kind of one of the newest hottest morphs in ball pythons so I started into the scaleless head project with just one male and produced some really interesting scaleless head. This one is a female lemon blast scaleless head, a pretty high expression scaleless head. And they used to be back in the day when I was in the projects, if it had more scales missing from the top of the head, it was actually worth more versus like a low expression where you really couldn't tell. But nowadays it seems like there's really no difference in price. So here is a male pastel bamboo and the interesting thing is is when these pastel bamboos first hatched out you really couldn't tell it much of a difference between the pastel and the regular bamboos really the only way you could tell is the difference in the the lightness on the color of the head and now that he's gotten bigger you could definitely tell there's quite a bit of yellow really popping out it definitely looks different than a regular bamboo all right, so this one is a male scaleless head, 50% head caramel albino, and kind of my thought was, if nobody buys these, I'm gonna try to breed them together, and it's possible you could get a caramel albino, completely scaleless ball python. Let me tell you, if you could produce something like that, it'd probably be worth 15 or $20,000. It'd be a pretty expensive snake. So take a look at the color on this snake. It is pretty impressive. It's quite unexpected. This is actually a scaleless head pastel, just a straight pastel. And look at the intensity of the color. You know, for a pastel, usually they're not this intense. And I'm convinced that the scaleless head has something to do with brightening and lighting, lightening and enhancing the color. I'm thinking even with one copy of the gene not completely scaleless, I'm thinking that maybe it thins the scales through the snake which is kind of interesting all right so here's another female scaleless head ball python and this one is actually going to shed a little bit but it's interesting you can kind of see a little bit of flaming up the sides here I'm not sure if that's from the uh, this is 50% head caramel albino so that could be like a marker of the head car caramel albino or it could be just from the scaleless head. I know the scaleless head kind of really changes the patterns. Uh, almost looks like Enchi in some of these scaleless heads and it really brightens, even the normals look a lot brighter. So here's another male scaleless head, 50% head caramel albino, and this guy is definitely big enough to breed. He'll be at the show. I imagine if you're really looking for a good breeder, this would be a guy that could hit the ground running. He could breed right away this coming season. So take a look at what happens when you mix calico with the bamboo. You get these really crazy looking snakes. This is awesome. I actually had one with some pastel in it and I sold it at one of the shows last fall. This guy is really awesome. So this is a female lesser bamboo. So you take a bamboo, you mix it with the lesser, you get one copy of each gene, and it turns into a blue-eyed leucistic, which is a white snake with bright blue eyes. I don't know if you can see the eyes on the snake. Really beautiful eyes on this blue-eyed leucistic. Let me see if I can get a better shot of the eyes here for you. But the eyes are really, really bright blue. It's pretty much the only time you'll see a blue eye on a snake is when you have the blue-eyed leucistic. And this one, I actually was kind of going back and forth between feeding live rats and fresh killed and frozen thawed. And this actually uh, has some little marks right here where the rat actually bit this snake. And then after I saw that, I was like, you know, that's the first time in all my time that I've ever actually had, you know, snake damage from a live rat. And I decided, you know, it's really not worth 
feeding live rats. I know you can really grow your snakes faster and they fast for a long time. You can get them back on food with live. Ball pythons, I think they really prefer live. As a matter of fact, if you have hatchlings, that's all they will eat for the first few meals are live mice. And really, you know, you're taking a risk. You know, I've had a lot of people comment, I'm going to only feed live all the time. And this is what you're risking. You're risking uh, hurting your snakes. So feed live with extreme caution. So here's another one. This is another male pastel bamboo. And so far, everything I've showed you up to this point are the snakes that I produced last year and this year. This is one of last year's hatchlings. And this guy looks really beefy. I can't believe how big and chunky he is. This guy would definitely be a good breeder for this year. All right, so this one is another female lemon blast scaleless head. It's almost exactly like my last scaleless head lemon blast. They're almost exactly the same, which is pretty interesting. The funny thing about these two snakes is they're from the same clutch and they almost eat and don't eat on the same exact schedule. Sometimes if one's not eating, the other one doesn't eat. And when one eats, the other one eats almost exactly. I don't know what if it has something to do with the genetics and the certain clutch or what it is, but I thought that was really interesting. All right, so here is another bamboo lesser. This one happens to be a male. And the interesting thing is if you bred this white snake with my other white snake, you would get a whole clutch of blue-eyed leucistics, but the, the interesting thing is the genetics would be different because you get super bamboos, super lessers, and bamboo lessers, and you wouldn't be able to tell them apart because they would all look exactly the same. All right, so here is a snake that I actually didn't produce. I actually bought this snake a couple years ago. This is the lesser gene, and the clown gene is a lesser clown. So the clown is recessive, lesser is codominant. It's in the blue-eyed leucistic complex, where if you get a super lesser, then you have a white snake. You mix the two together, and this is what you get. This snake is actually in a really deep shed, so you really can't appreciate the colors. You can see it's got a little red here on the belly, and that's just because uh, the, the, the pink hue really in the snake is because it's shedding. It really won't keep that pink hue as it uh, after it sheds it'll pretty much be gone but it's pretty it's, it's a pretty big snake and I'm thinking maybe maybe in a year year and a half this snake is gonna be ready to breed all right so take a look at this snake this is my albino pied male and let me tell you why I bought this snake I paid a pretty good price for him he's got some really interesting patterns right in the middle it's really interesting and almost when he was small it almost looked like a little tattoo that was tattooed right in the middle of his body and i bred him to quite a few snakes over the last few years and for whatever reason when i brought, paired him up with my clown female this year he just stopped eating and refuses to eat anything he keeps getting skinnier and skinnier and it's pretty much par for the course for ball pythons you know you can pretty much almost count on them for fasting at some point in their life all right so here's another one that i produced last year this is a male pastel bamboo and i'm starting to think that this video is going to be really long if i go through all my snakes so i think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through about half of them and then kind of break and then do a part two so it's not such a really long video but this guy is really awesome I really love what the pastel does with the bamboo all right so here is a fire pied male it has the fire gene which is a lightener and enhancer is along with the pied gene so the pied is basically splotches of white more or less white all through the pattern and if you have a regular pie, these are going to be really dark, these spots in here. And then the fire lightens it. And all the, the babies that I showed you earlier, this was the father. So this is where the 100% head pie comes from because you really need two copies of the recessive gene to get a visual. And with the fire, you only need one copy because it's co-dominant and you can see the fire in the offspring. All right, so I've had this girl for three years and she still is not really up to size for breeding. I, I think she's getting close, but speaking of live rodents, you know, I, I had her on live rodents for a while and it's pretty much all she would eat. And lately I've been trying fresh kill, frozen thawed, rats and mice, and she won't take anything. And you know, now that I've had uh, one rodent kind of down
damaged one of my snakes, I'm kind of hesitant to go back to the live. And, you know, if, if you don't do live on some of these snakes, they just don't eat. This one probably hasn't eaten in six months. And if I can get her back on feed again, get some weight in her, I can actually breed her. So this snake right here is probably my most aggressive snake. Some people say, no, snakes aren't aggressive, but let me tell you, this one will come after you. This one is a bumblebee. I think it might have some yellow belly in it. Uh, it's possible yellow belly, possible head pied. And this girl is another live feeder. She's really super skinny. And she was, she basically, the only thing she will eat is live. She refuses to eat anything else. But for some reason, she just does not like me. And if I just look at her for too long, she'll start snapping at me. All right, so this girl is my two-year-old clown female. When she was actually smaller, she was eating like crazy. She would eat every single time, time after time after time. And then she got to 1,500 grams. I thought, you know, I'm going to pair her up. And she actually laid a clutch of eggs this year. Really beautiful girl. Clown is recessive. It's pretty awesome. So this snake is pretty interesting. I actually bought it as a lesser pied, which is really interesting. But the interesting thing is, is it has blue eyes. So I'm thinking maybe it, it's kind of like a super lesser because of the blue eyes. I've never actually bred this girl because she's really not up to weight. And if you can kind of notice, she kind of has a kind of a corkscrew head wobble. So I'm thinking she may have spider in her. And She's really super finicky. She is a mouser only. But it'd be interesting to breed this to see if, if it and indeed is a super lesser, could have spider, and it could have, uh, well, it was sold to me as a pie, so I'm assuming it, it has a hundred, it's 100% pie. So really to prove it out, you'd want to breed it to a normal and then back to a pied to prove it out to see if it's, if it's actually a pied. But it's really some interesting genetics. And if it wasn't for the head wobble, that kind of concerns me. You know, I, everything with a head wobble, it's kind of, I kind of suspect it might have spider in it just because it's kind of got the corkscrew. And I don't really like breeding a lot of spider. And, you know, if it's, if I knew for sure it didn't have a spider, I'd probably breed it out and avoid doing the lesser with the pied. Could be that combination with the lesser pied that gives the head wobble. Here's my scaleless head male, the original scaleless head that I started with uh, just a few years ago. And this one, I think I paid about $1,200 for him. He definitely paid off because I got a lot of really neat scaleless head stuff. As a matter of fact, when I hatched out my scaleless head lemon blasts, they were selling for like, I think it was either $6,000 or $8,000 or something like that. And the prices really come down on these scaleless head, but he definitely was a really good investment. All right. So this is my pastel desert ghost male. And the interesting thing with desert ghost is really reduces the pattern. You know, you'd almost think there's enchi in here or something like that, but there's really not. And it's interesting, it has a black line right down the top and it's really faded compared to what it usually is. It's usually super bright and intense. You almost have to wear sunglasses, it's so bright. It's pretty incredible and it's because he's going into shed, he's in a really deep shed. As a matter of fact, when I pulled him out, he was hissing at me. He was not happy. Usually when snakes are going in shed, they are really grumpy. So here is a spider pied male. This is one of the few ball pythons that really bit me really bad. I was feeding him a rat and he lunged and grabbed my hand, wrapped around, he would not let go. And I'm really not gonna pick him up because I actually just fed him two rats and he's been on a really long fast, just went on food. But essentially when you mix the spider with the pied, you get an all white snake with just a little bit of color on the head. So here is my Coral Glow male, and this one is actually 100% head pied. I was gonna breed it with my pied. I keep breeding it with my pied, and my female just won't lay eggs year after year after year, and she's pretty beefy this year, and it doesn't look like she's gonna lay any eggs. So that was a major disappointment for this year. I was actually hoping for some Coral Glow pieds. But as a matter of fact, I think next year, I'm gonna increase the number of females that I pair this with and produce a lot more Coral Glows. It seems like a lot of people are really looking for more Coral Glows. 
All right, so here is another completely white snake, and the problem with white snakes is if they get dirty, you can see the dirt. They get really marked up in the tub, and you're kind of chasing all the little black spots on your white snakes, whereas if you have other snakes, you really can't see it. And then when they shed, of course, you know, most people say you don't have to give a snake a bath or anything, because when they shed, they essentially shed the whole skin, and it's basically cleans the snake every time they shed. This one's actually a spider pied white wedding. So it has the spider gene and the pie gene. You can see it has a little bit of bug eyes, which is kind of interesting. I've never actually heard of bug eyes in the spider pied. It's just a little bit, it's not as bad, I would think, as like a super lesser. The super lesser can look really bugged eyed, like almost, alien like with the super big eyes and some have smaller eyes it's really really interesting but this guy has jet black eyes really beautiful snake and if it wasn't for you know the kind of the head wobble of the spider this is kind of one of the ones i bought into and kind of regretted it as a matter of fact this one's been super picky i just cannot get it to eat i've had it for a couple of years and she will just not put on the weight and i'm thinking maybe about breeding her you know sometimes you can if you, you can breed out the spider breed it to like a normal you'll get spiders and half of them will come out without the spider i'm kind of on the fence is breeding more spiders you know something you it's, it's kind of a really controversial topic, but she is a really beautiful snake. So here's another one I produced last year. This is a male scaleless head, 50% head caramel albino. And you can see on this one that it it doesn't, it's not in shed at all. It's really, you know, just came out of the shed. It is really bright. And you can definitely see that the scaleless head really intensifies the colors on the snake. It's pretty amazing. I don't know if you can if you can actually pick that up, but the scaleless head for some reason it changes the entire appearance of the snake. And this one's a pretty low expression. You can see one tiny little dot right on the head that's missing a scale. It's almost it's almost hard to pick up. But the interesting thing about the scaleless head, you can also tell from the very last scale right before the vent. So if you look at the 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 vent which is uh, if the snake will, if the snake will stay still, it actually has, you know, where it goes to the bathroom, the vent, there's a scale right before the vent, and that scale is split in half. And that's how you can tell it's a scaleless head. See, like right here, the scale right here, if, if it'll hold still, that scale is split in two. Right there, you can see it. Right there. And, it, and the split vent scale is a sure sign that this is a scaleless head. As a matter of fact, some people are wondering if their snakes are scaleless heads. And if you look at the last scale right before the vent and it's split in two, you definitely have a scaleless head ball python. All right, so that was about half my snakes. I think I'm gonna cut it here because if we keep going, this, this video is gonna be super long. And I know I actually did all my snakes once and it was like an hour long video. It was way too long. And one last thing I wanted to show you is this corn snake. Take a look at this snake. Remember how bright and vibrant this snake used to be? And now it is really dull and faded out. This thing is ready to shed. Take a look at this snake. It is completely different. It is night and day compared to what I actually bought it as. It doesn't even look like the same snake. It's pretty amazing. And once they said, especially, you know, if you have some red king snakes or stuff like that, when they go into shed, they don't even look like the same snake. This is pretty incredible. I want to put this guy back because he's going all, all over. All right, so there you have it. That was half my snakes. It's always interesting going through all my snakes and kind of seeing, you know, what I have. It's especially interesting when I get into the future, like a year or two down the road, and I can look back at some of these videos and say, hey, I remember that snake. I wish I still had that snake. Or, you know, it's interesting to see how some of them grow and mature, especially my retics. They start pretty small. They grow really fast, especially Lucy. And I think in part two, I'll show you my retics and some of my breeder females and get more in depth into the rest of my collection. So thanks for watching and I will see you next time.